Welcome to the Crack House Chronicles, your favorite true crime podcast. I am Donnie, and with me is a man who used to think drinking beer was bad for you. So he just done a good thing and gave up thinking. It's Dale. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's when you got a thinking problem. <laughs> is that what that is? That's what it's called. Yeah. A thinking problem. You got a thinking problem. That's it. Just give up the thinking. Give it up. What's just... going on, dude? Oh man, it's a uh, it's vacation time. Yeah, we're on vacation, but we're recording. You got any good shout outs from anybody you want to mention before we get going, dude? Okay. Hey, hey, hey. We have a five star. Five star, five star. Apple Podcast Review from Mama Three Times. And it's because excellent podcast. I love listening to Donnie and Dale. They're personable, humble, and kind. She talking about us? I don't anyway. know. It must be <laughs> another Donnie and Dale. <laughs> anyway, unlike most podcasts, I find this one very relaxing. It's like listening to someone you trust and feel safe with just telling stories. Yeah, definitely somebody else. They obviously put in a lot of research in the cases they cover. Keep up the great work. I look forward to each and every new episode of the Crack House Chronicles. And that's uh, from Crystal from True Crime Brawls. Oh, yeah, the ones we just interviewed on Missy Beavers. I think that's it. Yeah, that is just awesome. awesome. Yeah, we have a lot of great friends, man, and uh, those two ladies are definitely top of the line. They have put the work in for Missy Beavers, no doubt about it. No doubt about it. Yep. So what pulls me off a vacation today? Well, today we have got an interview, man. (sighs) I've got cold chills already. Yeah, I've got got cold chills just thinking (laughs) about it. But you remember we covered... Lindsay Buziak's case back on episode 35. This was a couple of years ago for this us. This was man. Uh, April 6th of 2020. When we covered this case. Yeah. yeah. And ever since then, man, this case has really just got me. It still eats me, man. And I'll time. always Google something to see if I can find out something the latest. And, and everything, Dateline or anything that pops up, I watch it. Yeah, or any any this, kind this of interview. or consume me. Or yeah. anybody that covers this case, I yeah. always watch yeah. them, see what they've got. But Lindsay, her story was uh she was murdered on february the 2nd of 2008 and this was during a property viewing in saanich and saanich is a like a suburb of uh, victoria british columbia and she was lured to this house that she was showing by a man and a woman posing as prospective clients that they were looking to buy this house as a million dollar home and today on our podcast dale we have Lindsay's father, Jeff Buziak, and he, hero of mine. Yeah, and I think me and you've referred to this guy as the Tommy Lee Jones of dads. Yes, I love yeah, him. I love him. Yeah, we've we've seen several interviews up with him, and we wanted to get him on the show. We reached out to him, and we well, we he answered our call. It gives me cold cold bumps, yeah. goosebumps. Yeah. I don't think about him, but uh, it's gonna be good. Welcome to the show, Jeff. Well, thank you very much, gentlemen. I'm uh, humbled by your description. I, you know, really, I just look at myself as a frustrated dad uh, trying to get justice for his murdered daughter, and really, that's where I'm at. And uh, it's just, it's just been a nightmare for 15 years. I can't even imagine, man. No can't even imagine. We, uh, I reached out to you, and we, Dale and I, we've got a bunch of questions we've have about this case that it just stumps us, and we just want to find out from you a few things to, from the get go. Start out, tell us a little bit just about Lindsay. Just just describe her from your words. Yes, sir. She was just um, a really amazing young woman. Uh, you know, as far as uh, personality and social skills and uh, determination to succeed, it just topped for her. Um, but yet she was, you know, she was a humble person as well, but she loved her friends. Uh, and uh, she loved family, of course. You know, her sister, her mom and dad, just like top of the list, along with her friends, of course. Very close with her friends. Very dedicated to her girlfriends. And uh, very dedicated to her career. Mm -hmm. Uh, She found real estate on her own, even though that was uh, my career for many years. She had tried a few other things, and that just really fit the bill for her. And, you know, for her... She was very fortunate that she was blessed with good genes, so she was a very attractive young woman as Mm -hmm. well. So in a lot of ways, that opened doors for her, but in a lot of ways, it hindered her as well Hmm. because there was always that dynamic going on about, hey, this good-looking woman. Um, But she learned how to deal with that. I think the only challenge she had in her life at the time was choosing the right partner. 
And what did that look like to her? And what did her future look like? Yeah. You know, was she going to be a mom with kids pretty soon? Or was she going to dedicate herself to her career? And um, so, you know, she was a bit puzzled about that part. Uh, but she did finally kind of see her way that her career was very important. And that, um, you know, having a partner was, important as well but it wasn't the highlight of her life yeah uh she was very focused on her career and uh and her friends of course and doing exceptionally well she got into real estate and just took off like a rocket yeah so she had the personality to do it she had the social contacts to do it she had the contacts around the city she was born and raised in victoria actually in saanich she was born and raised in saanich and schooled there so, you know, if you're in a community like that your whole life, for her 24 years, that all comes home to pay, you know, so the person you went to grade four with is now buying a house, and it's like, hey, Lindsay's a realtor, let's call her. So it was working really, really well for her. So speaking of all that, at the time of her murder, she was dating a guy by the name of Jason Zalo. Can I... Yeah, she was living with uh, Jason, um, and actually at the time, yeah. you know, I don't hold back anything. At the time, she was wanting to end that relationship, and she was in the process of doing that. Okay. What was that relationship like? You know, she said she was wanting to end it. What was their relationship like, uh, you know, her describing it to you? Well... The best description I can give, without insulting anybody too much, is I think Lindsay was a couple steps above uh, Jason's place, and um, and so he really adored her and idolized her and just really loved her. Um, and you know, Jason just wasn't the right guy for her. Yeah, he was too much, too overbearing, too jealous, too insecure. You know, those sorts of things. Um, Lindsay was very confident in her own abilities, her social skills. Jason wasn't, and it became a problem. And uh, so Lindsay wanted to end that relationship and move on. But the problem was she worked for Jason's mom, and so there was uh, some intertwining there. And, of course, Jason didn't want to let go, so there was attempts to keep her in the fold. And, um, you know, there's talk out there that, oh, Lindsay was confused or she changed her mind or, you know, not really. Mm -hmm. I kept in really close contact with her. There was a lot of pressure on her not to leave the relationship. But uh, she was, that was her focus. That mm -hmm. was her focus to end the relationship. She just, she just said, Daddy, you know, I can't, I can't do it. He's like, uh, he's not my guy. He's not the right guy for me. Yeah, he always seemed kind of overbearing, maybe clingy way he came off on all the uh, interviews I saw him with. So, yeah, it would seem right to me for just trying to break free from that. Yeah, he was a really big guy, and uh, he had temper, of course, mm. um, and jealous. Right. And, you know, just not used to having the type of woman that Lindsay was. And uh, Jason's mom was more so than him as far as even jealous of Lindsay's beauty and youth and her ability with people. Her social skills are remarkable. I, I was even envious of them, you know, in a good way. I right. don't mean well, that in a kind of weird way. But uh, I always felt with, uh, well, with both my daughters, they got the best of their mom and me as far as social skills. I can be very personal and very very, very social at times, but I can bite too. I got a bit of a sharp tongue, and you know that sort of stuff. Right. And um, and so, you know, the mom is a bit more reclusive and not that dynamic in social situations, but very nice and warm and friendly and all that. So, Lindsay, of course, got the best of us, and so she was just dynamic. I used to just sit there enamored and watch her sometimes in social situations with a smile on my hmm. face, and sometimes she's shaking my head, just like, wow, like, <laughs> she's just so good at it, you know, just, it, it was natural for her. Yeah, I'm sure he wasn't used to being outshined, that was probably, yeah, and she's like, perfect for that. Yeah. Yeah, I don't, you know, I don't know if it was so much he being outdone, it was just 
he was overwhelmed by it. Right. Because in a social situation, without trying, Lindsay would be the light in the room. You know, she would be that sparkle in a room. And um, he just, uh, I don't think he knew how to deal with that. And, of course, if you've got a jealous streak in you, not good. Yeah, no. When you have a very attractive girlfriend and she's very dynamic socially. And, you know, you, got, you have to be quite a secure uh, man to have a girlfriend like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I agree totally. So getting into the Lindsay's case a little bit, she had received a phone call on her personal phone about a listing of a, a couple that was wanting to buy a home pretty quick. You know, in this situation, that's not uncommon because realtors here will advertise their cell numbers. Mm-hmm. So, again, there's talk out there in the public that, oh, how did they get her cell number? No, no, it was on her ads and her promo material. Okay. Her cell number was there. So, yeah, they called her up and... Uh, if you're familiar with corporate transfers, which a lot of realtors aren't, and certainly the public aren't, you do get calls like that as a real estate agent, which I've been since 1980. Um, you will get that call saying, hey, we've been transferred from New York or wherever it is. Uh, we're going to be in town this weekend, and uh, you know we've got three days to look around and possibly buy a house. Because companies will send a couple out, uh, for, let's say, two weekends to try and find a home. And if they're not successful, well, then they won't send them anymore. It'll be up to whoever, whichever spouse is being transferred to sort that out. So there's a bit of pressure on their side that the companies will say, we'll guarantee the sale of your home, we'll give you bridge financing, uh, go find yourself a house. Yeah. So literally, you know, they don't physically buy it in three days. But certainly they can choose one, write a contract, and have an accepted offer on it, conditional. And get the ball rolling on the purchase. Yeah. Right. Yeah. right. So for a real estate agent, that's a super call to get because it's almost like money in the bank. You're like, great, these people need to buy. You know, they've called me. I love it. What's odd about it is, Normally, there is some communication prior to that, not sort of really quick. Mm. And um, so that's where it starts to get fuzzy. Well, it was made out into the media like a big deal that Lindsay received this call on her personal phone, and it was they re- referenced a former client of hers. And this client couldn't be reached by Lindsay or anything like that. The The media made a big deal out of that. Is that... Is it a bigger deal than it should have been? Yeah. You know, I think that is a big deal. I think that because that was information that I shared, I asked Lindsay, because she called me often and said, hey, Daddy, I got a call from these people. And so I did ask her, I said, well, how'd they get your name? And she said, well, it was a referral from a client of mine. I go, well, that's easy. Phone the client. She said, I did, but they're away on holidays. So that's when it got really odd for me was I Mm. thought, okay, well, especially after the fact. Mm -hmm. Um, Somebody knew the client's name. Somebody knew they were out of town. Who would have that information? Well, not very many people. Right. Probably only people very close to Lindsay at work meaning her boss, her partner. That's probably about it. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. Exactly. Well, that's where I really start to question, like, okay, what's going on here? You know, what was that all about? Yeah, right. This is where the the shady really starts, yeah. Yeah, so, and, you know, this is all after the fact. Of course. You know, my daughter's murdered. Like, what the hell's going on? So when I start reviewing it, that I see stuff like that, and then I look at the corporate transfer. Well, who would know about a corporate transfer? Like, you gentlemen probably don't know the fine details of a corporate transfer. Most people don't. No. A lot of realtors don't even know about it. They've heard about it, but they don't know how it works. Well, whoever set Lindsay up knew exactly how a corporate transfer worked. Wow. Right. So... Yeah, so it starts to get suspicious. So now, to me, 
real estate's involved. Hmm. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking. Yeah. With her murder. It's your next Without part. a doubt. Yes. Because, you know, the media wants to say, or the police want to say, oh, it's like a drug deal, and this is the cartel. Like, come on. Some thugs out of Mexico know how a corporate transfer works? No. No. Some thugs from Mexico are going to create this big drama to kill somebody? No. They're going to come up to Victoria and go, where the fuck is she? Right. Exactly. Yeah, they'll go they're, over they're not there, be looking at no look house. around, <laughs> look around someplace and kill her. And, you know, hang her up from the bridge or something. That's what the cartel does. Not, oh, hi, we're transferring, and can we deal with you? And, you know, all this. It was set up like a play. Yeah. Like a ballet or something. It was very structured around real estate. Yeah. And it was actually narrowed down to one house. Because Lindsay phoned me frustrated and was like, Daddy, I can't find anything else to show him. There's only this one house. Mm. Well, of course, in retrospect, I think, yeah, because that's how it was set up. Right, that was the house you were supposed to show, yeah. Wow. This was this was researched right. a lot. This was researched a whole lot, Jeff. Yeah, it was set up uh, with somebody with a lot of knowledge of Lindsay and a lot of knowledge of real estate. Wow. Very intricate detail. No it? doubt. Yeah, I agree. Like, no doubt. You know, sure, the killers could have been from Chicago or Boston or California or Mexico. Sure. But whoever orchestrated it, whoever planned it, the conspirators were very close to Lindsay, knew her well, knew real estate very well. Mm-hmm. Well, who's that? Mm-hmm. So uh, there was about eight weeks before her murder. She came to Calgary to visit you. And I guess she was telling you about her relationship with Jason and all this stuff. And there's been talk that she had met a a friend of her ex-boyfriends at that time who was involved with some drugs. Uh, Is there anything to that at all? Uh, As far as I'm concerned, no. Uh, She came to visit me specifically to talk about her problem with her boyfriend and how she was going to work her way out of that because of the complication with boyfriend's mom was her boss. Yep. And, uh, you know, expressing to me how mean and nasty the boyfriend's mom could get. Mm. So, and I experienced that myself, the nastiest woman I've ever met in my life, bar none. And I grew up with a woman my father married because my mom died when I was two. Um, I used to think she was the devil's sister. Well, boyfriend's mom, I would say, tops her. Wow. Wow, man. Without a doubt. Without a doubt. And I personally experienced that before murder and certainly after. Um, So as far as her visit with me, it was specifically to discuss that. Like, how do I, Daddy, how do I get out of this mess? Like, those are the exact words. Hmm. And, you know, I was, I was a little bit taken back. I was very close with Lindsay. But, you know, in my mind, I grew up traditionally, you know, where sort of women stay at home and, and, um, you know, girls are closer to mom and boys closer to dad you know that sort of scenario in my era and that's how our girls were raised you know stay at home mom Uh, so I was quite wow you know you flew out to Calgary to talk to me about this so I asked her um, you know what's mom got to say about this and she goes oh god I can't talk to mom about this she loves the guy and you know thinks he's great but he's not he's an idiot you know, I can't stand him. You know, that was kind of the talk mm-hmm. with her. So, yes, she went out with an uh, old friend. Um, like, the guy she went out with was somebody she had been in, like, you know, grade two with or something and kept in touch with over the years. Um, and that was for, like, an hour and a half. Basically, picked her up went across the river from where I live, which would have been eight minutes, uh, to a restaurant, had dinner, and came home. 
Hmm. I was even surprised when she came back. I was like, oh, wow, you're home so early. She goes, well, yeah, of course. I, you know, I'm here to visit you. And uh, I just wanted to say hi to those guys, but they wanted to go for dinner. So that was one evening, and then another evening, she went out briefly, same thing, for like an hour, and then came back, and I said, oh, you know, you're back early. Yeah, of course, Daddy, you know, I want to visit yeah. with you. I'm just I'll saying hi, just saying hi to these guys, basically. We went to have a coffee, and I came back. So, you know, there was nothing amiss there. I don't know why there's this big deal about, you know, that drug bust and Lindsay, da 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 You know, sure... Maybe there was some mention of that, but, you know, the reality is I talked to some of the people involved with that big drug bust, and, you know, of course, everybody denies involvement. Everybody does. That's why it's not sold. But, um, you know, they were just like, Jeff, like, come on. (coughs) You know, why would we kill a little girl who we knew? from when she was really young because my stupid brother went out and got busted with, you know, a bunch of drugs in the car and guns and cash and then they go to the house where he lived and they got a bunch more drugs and guns and cash. Like, what the hell has that got to do with Lindsay? Like, he was driving down the street with a couple other guys, like a bunch of idiots from a nightclub. They get pulled over by police and, oh, gee, they got 20 keys of coke in the trunk and some guns and money. And then they go to the house, and it's like, oh, you know, another 50 keys and guns and money. And you know, what's that got to do with Lindsay? That all happened, you know, before murder. So, you know, yes, somebody could have said, oh, Lindsay ratted you guys out. Well, they knew how they got caught. Right. They knew. Like, they knew how they got caught. And, you know, when you think about it, I I listen to some of these figures of, you know, these drug lords out of Mexico and stuff. They are shipping, like, thousands of tons of cocaine to North America. Like, thousands of tons. Mm. And they're not killing somebody up here because they get busted. Busted's part of their gig. Oh, yeah. Like, we lose a percentage, but the rest gets through. So, let's be real here. Some guys get busted with 50 keys or whatever, which is nowhere near, even near one ton. Do you think some drug lord from Mexico is going to be, Oh, the fuck, squad, let's kill him! Like, come on. They're dealing with billions of dollars and hundreds of thousands of tons of cocaine. Yeah. They're going to go kill some little girl from Victoria who has nothing to do with the drug scene because they lost a few keys? Like, give me a break. Yeah, I agree. That's the most far-fetched thing I've ever heard of. Plus, I do know that 13 to 14 people were arrested in that whole drug bust thing. And they, it all looked like they were going to face some serious prison time. They, Sandwich Police got permission to go to each one of them individually and say, all right, tell us something about Lindsay's murder and you're off scot-free. Wow. Anything. Not one person out of that group of 13 or 14 had anything. They were like, Lindsay who? You know, like, what are, you, what are you talking about? So, I have a university degree in psychology. So I know about testing and people's behavior and you know, all that kind of stuff. I studied it, got a degree in it. Um, out of 14 people, if they know about Lindsay's murder, you're going to get one or two that'll crack. Oh, yeah, somebody's going to say... Chances are, you yeah. might get three or four. And if you don't initially, you'll get it later. Well, they got nothing. Like, that doesn't, statistically, doesn't make sense. And some of the people involved there, there was a couple women, one of them had a child. You know, they're going to be told, you'll never see your child again, you're going to be in prison, tell us. they tell. They would tell. 
nothing. They got nothing out of that, and to this day, nothing out of that. Hmm. So to me, that's a red herring. Oh, yeah. You know, maybe there's some remote connection. Yeah. Maybe. Maybe, yeah. All like right. Intel, Intel I've discovered tells me that um, the so-called rat on that whole drug bus thing was from Lindsay's boyfriend's family. Ooh. Oh, man. That is so crazy, Jeff. Wow. So let's talk about, yeah. let's talk a little bit about the, the day Ooh. she was murdered, if you don't mind. Um, her and Jason went to eat a late lunch, and then he had to go pick up a friend of his at a, a car lot or, or a car shop or something, an auto body shop or something, and Lindsay was going to go on and show the house. And Jason was going to meet her there a little bit later. He's going to be about 10, 15 minutes later. Yeah, what happened there was Lindsay was adamant with me that Jason was going to be at the showing because by the time the day of this meeting came around, Lindsay was quite concerned. She expressed that to a fair number of people, girlfriends, people she worked with. They even offered to go with her to the showing. I offered to fly out there and go with her. And she's like, Daddy, no, Jason's going to be there. And I was like, Lindsay, are you sure? She's like, Dad, Jason's going to fucking be there. Okay, okay. Make sure he's there. He's going to be there, Daddy. Like, that's it. Okay. Well, he fucking wasn't. Hmm. He wasn't there. Hmm. So, what happened was, they had a late lunch, which odd to me. He paid the bill at 4.20. Um, he supposedly went off to meet with clients to get some documents signed. That was their first story. Okay. And um, so then he was late right. because uh, he met a friend of his. They were going to go out for dinner because they played hockey together later that night. Well, if you look at that, why is he going out for dinner when he just finished lunch at 4.20? Yeah, weird. Is he, like, doubling up on his meals, or what the hell's going on here? Um, and the friend didn't want to go. And he got roped into it. He had to go home anyhow and mm -hmm. pick up his hockey gear. And Jason pastored him. No, no, come on, let's go for dinner, let's go for dinner. Well, I have to go home, and I want to go home to my wife and kids. So, anyhow, he went over, and it turned out where he went is this auto shop that Tells wheels, tires, and tints windows, mostly for gangsters. So he was there hanging out, having a beer. Like, obviously, he wasn't that concerned about his girlfriend that, you know, said to me, Daddy, he's going to fucking be there. Right. And she turned everybody else down, co-workers who said, we'll go with you. No, no, Jason's going to be there. I mean, that's documented. Yeah. Well, where's he? He's having a beer with his pals. So the first story was, oh, I need to get some documents picked up. And I said, well, why weren't you there? Oh, well, you know, uh, uh, Lindsay, I had to get Lindsay to sign them. And I was like, okay, look, I'm a realtor. Realtors don't sign documents. Clients do. Lindsay didn't have to sign any documents. Oh, oh well, uh, they were time. So the next story was, oh, they were time-sensitive documents. I go, well, he was a realtor also and a mortgage broker. I said, well, I'm a realtor. I understand how that works. If it's time sensitive, all you have to do is phone the other agent or client and say, okay, signed. You know, we got a deal. I'll deliver the documents later. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. Right, exactly right. So then it was like, <clears throat> oh, well, I had to get the documents to Lindsay. I was like, what for? You could have delivered them. Or you could have given to her later that evening because you lived with her. Oh, well, uh, uh, I was going to go check on her. Oh, you're going to check on her now. We were supposed to be there. Yeah. Hmm. Oh, well, well she, did, she didn't want me to come. Oh, well, she swore at me that you were going to be there. 
Wow. What am I going to believe? I'm going to believe my daughter. Well, he'd, he had texted her he, saying he was going to be like 10 or 15 minutes late. What was with that? Yeah. Well, yeah. Yeah. What was with that? Do you want my opinion or do you want the mechanics of it? I want uh, what you, what, what do what, you think? Yeah. You want my opinion? Exactly. Yes, my opinion was he didn't want to go there because there was a murder going on. That's what I think. Yeah. That's my opinion. Because and when he got there, he drove by the house, saw some people supposedly coming out, and then drives by and goes and parks in the cul-de-sac facing the opposite direction. Yeah. And you ask him, well, you know, why didn't you go in? Well, I thought the meeting was starting. Well, meetings don't fucking start with people leaving, do they? Exactly. Yeah, exactly, man. He, he, you know, there was, there looks like they're leaving, and he's saying, oh, uh, I didn't want to interrupt. Well, the meeting's over. So then he sits there and waits for 10 minutes till everything calms down, turns around, goes and parks out on the street, sits and waits for another 10 minutes. So, you know, what's that telling you? Yeah, hey, he's, he's, I'll wait till things are done here before I go to the house. Yeah, I'm going to move around and so I'll make sure I don't see anybody. Supposedly, around. he's Mr. Cool, right? He's not affected. I, I'm a cool dude. Right? That's his thing. And uh, you ask him why, you know, he didn't cry or show any emotion on Dateline. It's like, oh, well, you know, everybody has a different way of showing their emotion. You know, I don't get that rattled about things. Oh, well, you walked up the door, it was locked, and you phoned 911. I have a psychology degree. That's emotional panic. Exactly. Like, the guy was 6'3", 240. He fucking phones 911. Yeah. Like he's panicking like a little child. Hmm. 6 3, 240. The door's locked. What's the panic? The door's locked. So what? Yeah, the door's locked and I see some shoes. He's, and he's flipping out. Right. He's like, phone, first thing he does, phone 911. Hmm. Yeah, that's panic. Yeah. Or, covering your eyes. Set up. Yes. So is <laughs> like, why would you phone nine one one? Oh fuck, the door's locked. I'll give her a call. To me, it's all crazy, right? Okay. Like, if I'm supposed to be there, and supposedly, according to him, I loved her very much. You're not going to drive by and see people by the door and go sit and wait. If you really care for who that is, you're going to be like, "Hey, what the fuck's going on here? I'm going to go check it out." Yes. Especially, Especially if you told her you were going to be there. No, I never understood why we, right. why he moved the car unless he's just moving to make sure he don't see what he's not supposed to see. Exactly. You know? Oh, gee, I don't see anything. Oh, well, I'll just wait a little while longer. Right, because I was wait like... Wait for what? You know, like, what like, are you waiting for? Then he texts her, and it's just like... Are you okay? You know? Are you okay? Well, why did he text her, are you okay? Is he thinking there's something wrong? Right. Yeah. Like, wouldn't you, wouldn't you text and say, hey, babe, sorry I'm late, I'm sitting outside. You need me to come in, I'm wrong, I'm right on my way, blah, 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 something, thumbs up, something, yeah. yeah. Right. And the, re the reason he should have been there and gone and met the people was he was a mortgage broker. He was providing finance for all the deals Lindsay did. So wouldn't you think he would have pulled up and went in and said, hi, I'm Jason. Do you guys need financing? I can help you out. Here's my card. Right. It's not, I'm not just Joe Blow. Nobody right. stumbling in the door. I have a reason to be here. Yeah, it makes all the sense in the world. Exactly. Exactly. So, Jeff, when uh, cool. they got to the house, his uh, his buddy went around the back because the front door was locked and found, the, I guess, the back door unlocked. And he came in and let Jason in. And I find this very odd that Jason, his first instinct is to run upstairs. Yeah, so what happened there was they went to the front door. Door was locked. Jason phoned his mom. Of course, he was, he's famous for phoning his mommy. Mm -hmm. um, and asked her if she knew where the key was or whatever, lockbox code, that kind of stuff. 
and then well, let's see if we can get in. So then he went one way, and his friend went the other way, and his friend went to the, actually it was the side of the house, not okay. the back. Okay. So he went to the side of the house, and then Hollard said, hey, there's a door open here. He looked over a patio fence. So Jason come running back and boosted them over. And so the guy went through the house, opened the front door, and as he was opening the front door, it opened inward. As he's opening it, Jason pushed the door and him aside and ran straight upstairs to the bedroom where Lindsay was. This was a house he had supposedly never been in, right. supposedly, and, you know, like a 3,500-square-foot home. Wow. Big. But he pushed the door open straight up the stairs, which weren't directly by, beside the front door. Mm -hmm. Like straight up right to where Lindsay was. Well, there's like four bedrooms up there. And the downstairs had, you know, separate living room, dining room, kitchen, family room, laundry room, office area. You know, what happened with, hey, Lindsay, are you around here? Like, why the panic? Right. You know, I I sold houses for many years. I don't anymore. I do commercial real estate now. But um, when I finished the showing, I always used to lock the door. Actually, I'd lock the door during the showing because, you know, neighbors will wander in. Other people will drive by. They'll see cars, lights on. They'll just walk in. And you'll be like, hey, what's going on? Oh, well, we thought, you know, we'd have a look at the house. Right. So I always used to lock the door to avoid that. Um, especially when I was locking up, you know, if the clients left, I'd lock the doors and then I'd go around, shut off all the lights and all that kind of stuff and then leave. Cause you know, when first part of my career, I noticed if I left the door open, you know, I'd be going through the house and then all of a sudden I get back to go and there's people standing there and I'd be like, well, hi. <laughs> They'd be like, Oh, we thought maybe you were the realtor. We just wanted to have a look. Usually it was neighbors. So, you know, that's fine. Maybe you get some new clients, but I just found if you're going to another house or you want to go home for dinner or whatever it is, lock the door, go shut the lights off, come down, go out the door, lock it, and leave. Makes sense to me. So, obviously, I taught Lindsay that. Hmm. So, for Jason to think it was a big deal that the door was locked is all a bunch of bullshit in my mind. Hmm. Makes like we're, yeah. we're talking my game here. You know, I was started in real estate in 1980. So, they don't fool me. Like, that's this is my game. People don't tell me how it works in real estate. You have to ask me. You know, can you imagine now I'm 40 some, 43 years in real estate? Yeah, you've, <laughs> you've seen a little bit of everything there. <laughs> Yeah, rookies don't tell me how real estate works. Exactly. And people don't give me excuses for something. I know how it works. Uh, yeah, I get it, man. I get it, too. It's perfect. It makes sense to me. Totally. Now, Jeff, there was some time after her murder that there was a a phone call that a friend of Lindsay's had received. Her name was Nikki. And she'd got this call in the middle of the night or late at night. I think she was asleep. And it was a woman... I guess speaking uh, an accent or a foreign language or something, and Nikki couldn't quite understand what she was saying. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? And um, yeah, for sure. Because okay. Nikki called. Nikki called me. She was really scared. Uh -huh. And um, what it was was at that time, Nikki worked uh, at a pub as a ho as a hostess and server, and um, so she had worked was working late and of course upset about Lindsay's murder so it was really early in the morning she received the phone call not middle of the night okay it was really early in the morning and of course her hours were a bit different than other people because working in the hospitality industry so she was sleeping phone rings answers that you know she's half asleep she's like what what who are you what's going on you know what do you want uh, can't understand what you're saying. And she said, you know, it was a foreign accent. So she just kept repeating that. Like, what do you want? Like, repeat that again. Who are you? What's going on? And they just kept talking to her. Sounded like 
foreign language accent, and she couldn't make out what they were saying. So finally, the other person hung up. So then Nikki was laying there going, okay, what the hell is that all about? And then she started to get scared. She was thinking, oh, shit, Lindsay murdered, foreign accent, you know, blah, 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 blah. So literally laying there, she went, fuck you. She grabbed her phone and pressed redial. And it just went click, pressed it again, click, pressed it again, click, pressed it again, click. She just kept pressing redial. They kept canceling the call till she finally, like after 20, 30 tries, person answered and it was Shirley Zalo yeah. Lindsay's boss boyfriend's mom whoa what did Shirley have to say so, to her about of course. that well Shirley has a story for everything well prepared so her story is oh I was calling Nikki our office manager because one of our workers didn't show up one of our front desk people didn't show up at my office, so I was calling the office manager at another office to get a replacement. And I said, oh, and her name was Nikki, spelt differently. Hmm. So I said, okay, you know, besides where were you calling another office to get a replacement for your office? You're the fucking manager. Find your own replacement. But besides that, I said, well, why did you have Nikki's number in your phone? She doesn't even know you. Right. In the middle of the night. She was like, oh, uh, well, Jason must have put it in my phone. <laughs> I said, well, why would Jason put it in your phone? No sense. Well, you know, he knew the girl, so when he was detained, they gave him, or they kept his cell phone, so the morning he got out after the murder, I gave him my phone to go buy some clothes, because the condo was in lockdown, they'd kept his phone in his vehicle. Yeah. So, it so happened that Shirley Zalo went over to Lindsay's mom's place the morning after the murder. Nikki was there with another friend of Lindsay's crying with Lindsay's mom. Shirley arrives and says to her other son, Ryan, Take these two girls and go get Jason from the police station. I want to talk to Evelyn, Lindsay's mom. Well, I'm thinking, shows how much she cares that she's sending somebody else to go get her son. Why didn't she go fucking get him herself? Yeah. So, Jace, so Ryan goes with Nikki and the other girlfriend to pick up Jason. And the girls were like, you know, they didn't want to do that. So, anyhow, they go, and oh yeah, and Shirley says, so they come back, Shirley says, here's 500 bucks, I think it was, go buy some clothes. Like, take the girls and go buy some clothes. So off they go again. And Jason goes and buys, you know, some sweats and a hoodie or something. So, then they come back, and Shirley says, okay, we're going to go for lunch. So, the girls are now getting scared. So they all hop in the car, and they're like, okay, where do you want to go for lunch? Well, Nikki says, let's go to this pub where I work. Okay, so off they go. They get there. Girls want to get the hell out of here. So one of Nikki's customers was there. So she said, hey, can you give us a ride home? We want to get the hell out of here. So the guy said, yeah, sure. Said, okay, we're going to get our stuff. So they go back to the table to grab the stuff, and Shirley's like, where are you going? And they're like, well, we're going to get a ride from my customer. No, no, I'm driving you home. No, it's okay. We're going to go. Finish your lunch. No, we're finished. Bring us the bill. We're driving you home. She's a very commanding mm. woman. So they hop in the car. 
Brian's driving, Shirley's in the front, and I think Jason and the two girls are in the back. So they're driving away from the restaurant. Shirley turns around to these two girlfriends of Lindsay and goes, okay, you girls know too much. Jason talks way too much. Keep your little fucking mouth shut or you know what's going to happen to you. And she sliced her finger across her throat. Wow. Whoa. Yeah. Holy, holy cow. Like, this is, this is reality. That's getting serious, Jeff. Wow. Absolutely. I had uh, seen an interview with you, Jeff, a while back. I don't know exactly when the interview was, but you had said in the interview that y'all are targeting five people in this case. Has anything changed on that? You know, no. I probably, well, not probably. I chose five because at that time I looked at it and I thought, okay, we know there were two people at the house. Okay. Right? Yeah. Right. Right? We know. Right. We know one or two planned it that probably weren't the people at the house. Yeah, at least I'd say, yeah. And and I'm believing there was an intermediary between the people who planned and the people who killed. So that makes five. Yeah, makes sense. Very much so. So that's my opinion. Yeah. Why do you think she was targeted, Jeff? What what made Lindsay a target, in your opinion? Well, when she came to visit me in December before she was murdered, during that visit, she told me, Daddy, I saw something I shouldn't have seen. And I was like, okay. You know, I'm trying to be a cool dad. And I had a... I don't know if you want to call it an agreement or whatever, through lots of discussion and relationship stuff with my daughters. It was always like, I'm not going to be an overbearing father, because I can be, you know, I can have that nature about me. But I said, no, I'm going to respect you, treat you like a woman, and I'm not going to pressure you, and, and not be that dad that's like, you know, overbearing and demanding and all that stuff. Exactly. So when she told me that, I mean, I'm not thinking, oh, my daughter's going to get murdered. Of course. You know, I'm thinking, okay, fine. She's going to, you know, she'll tell me. So I said, oh, okay, Lynn, what's going on? She goes, oh, you know, I can't tell you right now. And, you know, my experience with women is that Sometimes they approach things like that, and you got to be calm and, you know, draw it out of them. They want you to draw it out of them. Right. So I was like, okay, Lens, um, anything I should know about? And she just said, oh, that's not good. And I said, well, maybe you should tell me. And she said, you know, I will, but not right now. Hmm. And I said, so I, got, I started to get concerned. So I said, Linz, you know, honey, if something ever happened to you, somebody should know. So, you know, you should tell somebody, and probably I'm, you know, I'm that person. Um, and she goes, I know, Daddy, I know. She said, I'm dealing with it. I'm not going to, I can't tell you right now, but I'll, I'll tell you. Okay, fine. So again, I'm not sitting there thinking, hey, my daughter's going to get murdered. Exactly. Um, and so what I suspected was, and I still do to this day, it was something to do with the people she was with, meaning, you know, boyfriend and mom and that family, because otherwise she would have told me. She told me lots of stuff about, I mean, a, a few times she used to say to me, Oh, my God, Daddy, I tell you more than I tell my girlfriend sometimes. It's so weird. I go, oh, it's okay, Lens. You know, obviously you feel comfortable telling me, and I don't share it with anybody. So, you know, that's why you feel comfortable telling me all this stuff. Right. So I'd heard st lots of stuff over the years about people and, you know, guys doing things that were inappropriate and all that stuff. So 
I knew, you know, I know my, I knew my daughter well. So I knew whatever it was, it involved the people that she was involved with at the moment, meaning boyfriend, mom. And that as soon as she parted, because we'd already worked out a plan of how she was going to depart that relationship, I knew she'd tell me after. Right. Well, as we all know, she never made it. Mm. Wow. Nope. To tell me after. They shut her up. And you know what rings in my ear? It just haunts me to this day. Well, two things. One, I wish I would have grabbed her and put her in a headlock and give her a noogie until she told me. <laughs> but, you know, obviously, you're not going to do that. But that haunts me. The second thing that haunts me was my first meeting with Shirley Zalo. Was before Lindsay's murder. I'd never met her before in my life. And then I have a video on my Facebook about it. And, you know, I was washing some dishes in a sink, and she walked up to me, never met her before in my life, and she said, get out of my way, I want to get a glass. That's my fucking introduction wow. to this woman. Not, hi, you must be Jeff, I'm Jason's mom, nice to meet you. No, her opening line was, get out of my way, I want to get a glass. Man, good lord. So I look at her with my hands in the water, and I go, Pardon me. She puts her hands on her hips, and she was a fat ass woman at the time, still is. And she starts swaying her hips with her fists on her hips and bearing down on me. And she goes, Do you fucking know who I am? When I say get the fuck out of my way, I mean get the fuck out of my way. That's my introduction to Shirley Zalo. Wow. Wow. What a way to meet somebody. Yeah. I I would refer to that kind of behavior with a C word, which I won't say here. I understand. Yeah, I understand, <laughs> yeah. So, totally. I, I wring the water off my hands, and I turn around, and I go nose to nose with her, and I go, wrong fucking guy, lady. Clean up your act, or that pretty little girl out there and I are leaving in about two minutes. Do you understand that fucking language? Hmm. Ooh, oh, she probably she not goes, used to that. Oh. <laughs> she goes, okay. She goes, okay. Please get the fuck out of my way. Wow. Like, that is who that woman is. So, what haunts me hmm. to this day, to this very moment? Those words. Do you fucking know who I am? Those were her words. Well, she showed me who she was, didn't she? Wow. My daughter's dead. She fucking showed me who she was. Man. Hmm. And now that monster has the gall to sue me and two other women. Hmm. Just despicable person, in my opinion. In my opinion, pure evil. Pure fucking evil. In my opinion... With a degree in psychology, psychopath. And she can sue me to the end of the world for saying this, right, on this very podcast. But I don't care. That's my opinion. That's based on fact. Her standing right in front of me. And me having many experiences like that with her. Look that up in any psychology book you want. That is evil. I had no idea about this family, man. Wow. I didn't. I had no. I had no clue. And you're out there on the front line, so yeah, yeah. Wow. wow. Jeff, what do you think it'll take, or what's the key to solving Lindsay's case? What do you think it's going to take? DNA. Do they have any DNA from the house? Yes, they do. They keep saying they don't. They're full of shit. They got DNA. And what happened was through all the hard work that's done by the many volunteers who helped me and, you know, my efforts of pushing this on day after day, um, we've got an overseer from a major crime unit that oversees the case and directs it. We threw a bunch of effort of my volunteers and myself they got some assistance from the FBI, which is 
kind of unheard of in Canada, because that's a U.S. branch, of course. Mm-hmm. But I'm not sure you guys are even aware, but the FBI have offices in major cities in Canada. They're watching, right? Oh, yeah. They're there. Um, so, plus, we've got some help from the provincial government. And so where we're at right now is there is uh, forensic work going on in one of the top labs in the U.S., and police are feeling very confident about that. So they're doing three tests. That's awesome. And the results hopefully send us to arrest. So, you know, that's what it's going to take. The other thing it'll take of course, is somebody confessing. Yeah, right. Um, you know, that may or may not happen. The other thing it would take is somebody go out there, grab a couple people, tie them up to a tree and whip them, or chop their fingers off or their dicks off or whatever. We'd have all the answers we need. That may happen, too. Hmm. What? So that's what, right, well, that's what it'd take. Yeah. That's all right. What? So with, Shir- with Shirley Zalo suing three people right now, you know, what it's done is scared everybody from talking, which is, you know, obviously on purpose. Well, yeah, of course. Of course. So now everybody's scared to say anything except me uh, because they'll be sued by Shirley Zalo. Hmm. So obviously... You know, she's complaining that it hurt her business and, you know, she's not making enough money anymore. Well, she bought a home, a holiday home down in uh, California in Palm Desert or something. Obviously, it hasn't hurt her career that much. Mm, Obviously not. You know, she lives in a multi-million dollar house. She still has her lake cottage, you know, drives fancy vehicles, has the money to sue us. That's probably going to cost her a couple hundred grand which will get her nowhere. You know, she's suing two old ladies who allegedly said she was a psychopath. Well, <laughs> in my opinion, I'm not afraid to say that with my psychology background, because I believe she is, in my opinion. Yeah. Okay, uh, how often do the authorities get in contact with you on Lindsay's case? Or do you have to contact them, it seems... At this point, I speak with the um, major crime member who oversees the case once a month. Okay, that's pretty good. Savage Police will not communicate with me any longer. Really? Hmm. No. Damn shame. It is a shame. You know, it's interesting. We've had about six heads of the file. I think four or five mayors, four or five police chiefs, and nothing. You know, in the real world, that would be called failure. People would be fired. You know what they do in Saanich? Promote them, give them pay raises, Mm -hmm. give them a bonus and retire them. They failed at their job. Mm -hmm. Like, what the hell's with that? Right now, I believe the, the police have manipulated the public to believe there's some kind of special deal outside of the norms of society. No, they're not. They're employees of the people. To protect the people, to work for the people. If either one of you gentlemen went to work and did nothing for 15 years, do you think you would last? No. (laughs) I talk to corporate heads of oil companies here in Calgary where I live, and I ask them, I say, You know, if you're going to go drill oil in an oil field and you assign that to the engineers and they don't do any drilling, what do you do? Well, they're fired. I said, well, how long does that take? They go, like, six days, six weeks? When we assign them a project, if it's not done, you're fired. Well, that's how the real world works. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. That's all the police work. The police are like, oh, this takes time. It's very complicated. Relationships break down. Somebody will talk. And I tell them, I go, well, we don't need you for that. You're waiting for the murder to solve itself. Right. We don't need you. 
Why do we need you? Well, if they make a confession, well, I don't need you for a confession. I can take them to the media or directly to the prosecutor's office. I don't need you. What's your job here? Well, our job's to solve it. Well, you're not doing that. You need to be fired or solve it. Do you know what one of the police chiefs out there told me once, years, a few years, quite a few years back? He said, Jeff, I'm reassigning all the officers. I said, well, why would you do that? I'm tired of them sitting around with their feet up on the desk waiting for a confession. I said, are you fucking kidding me? He's like, no. Like, he was puzzled why I would question that. <laughs> and I said, well, I would be pissed off too. As a matter of fact, I'd go kick their ass and tell them to go get a fucking confession, not sit there and wait for it. Isn't that your job? Right. And he looked at me puzzled, almost cross-eyed, like, well, what's this guy talking about? Like, they don't understand anymore that their job is to investigate and solve. That's their job. Yeah, that's right. Good and in Saanich, what happens is when they don't do that, they get promoted and get a pay raise. Hmm. hmm. That's a shame. It is. Bullshit. Jeff, what can our listeners and all the listeners out there do to help? Is there any anything they can do or just pass the word, click and share? Um, is there a contact number or anything that they can call to contact somebody? What can the public do? You know, the best thing, the best thing they can do is uh, they can write to the mayor of Saanich and ask them, because the mayor of Saanich is head of the police board. And if he got... 500 or 20,000 letters. Yeah. And they should CC it to the media in Victoria and say, what the hell are you doing? Why isn't this murder solved? Everybody seems to know who did it. Like, what are you doing? Why are you covering this up? We're watching you from around the world. Yeah. Yeah. It's awful shady. Like, yeah. What is wrong with you people? Well, we have listeners around the uh, world, well, and... We'll definitely put the mayor of Sandwich's address in the show notes for this episode and on our social medias for sure and get this out there, man. Absolutely. Try, try to do and something. And the police chief of Sandwich, too. He needs to receive those letters. Yeah. Absolutely. And the premier of the province of British Columbia. They need to receive those letters. What the hell is wrong with you people? Yeah, I agree, man. It's coming on 16 years, and you haven't solved this simple murder. The most heinous crime against a human since the beginning of humanity. It's the worst crime ever. Yeah, yeah. It is, man. And you know what it does? And there's a lot of people out there in my shoes that will understand this. The system is protecting the bad people. They protect the criminals. Wow, the victims of this homicide, and I hate to classify myself as a victim, but we're in prison. We're in mental health prison, waiting for authorities to solve it. I, they won't even say they have suspects. They won't tell you anything. It's like they torture you while they protect the criminals. Why aren't they named? Why don't they have it in the media? Here are our prime suspects. Right. Right. Well, yeah, they just, protect them. It's just like they've done you well, in. we can't name any names. And I go, what are you doing for us? Right. What are you doing for us? Nothing. Hmm. I said, you've got murderers, conspirators and murderers have been walking around that community for 15 years. Like, that's putting the public in danger. What are you doing for us? Nothing. Right. It's like, it's like when they... Uh, they, they put in their hours every day, go for coffee six times, have a few chuckles, and go home. Yeah. They don't give a shit anymore. I asked a police officer once, I said, isn't there anybody there that can really just like dig their teeth into this and get obsessed with it, and I'm going to solve this? He goes, oh, we can't do that anymore. I go, what do you mean you can't do that anymore? Yeah, you get paid well, for you know, the other guys will get pissed off, and... You know, you'll make them look bad, and so no, we got to sort of just follow the rules. What? That's where policing has got us. Hmm. And you know what? Not only that, but 
if they get stressed out, oh, they get counselors and time off and pay and all that stuff. Well, I work in a world that's commission only. Do you know how many years I went without making any money and nobody was paying me? Was I off on stress leave? Was Did somebody send me counselors? No. Mm-hmm. I live by myself. I'm single. Was there somebody here, you know, cooking me meals, washing the washing my clothes, cleaning the house? No. If the police get stressed out, they get all that and more and get paid. I didn't get paid. Mm. What do they do for us? They make us, they make people believe that, oh yeah, we're there for you and, you know, we're going to, no, they're not. They're there to collect, collect a paycheck, put in their time so they retire. They get to retire early because they're a cop. Right. Mm-hmm. You know, I named a cop once and said, oh, he's got a daughter and a wife. He phoned me furious. You're putting my family in jeopardy. I go, you have a fucking gun. You get to carry it. I don't. Hmm. You're a cop. You think I'm not in danger? I've been threatened constantly. I've been threatened right to my face. You're fucking going down, bitch. I heard that right from bad guys in Victoria. Wow. I tell the cops, I go, well, be careful of the positions you put yourself in. The guy told me that right in front of a police officer. Jeez. And I said, he's threatening me, arrest him. They go, oh, you provoked him. I was like, what are they doing for us? Nothing. Nothing. 16 years. My daughter's murder's unsolved. Mm. They're supposed to be servants of the public. Yes. Right? Exactly. Public exactly. Servants. Yeah. That's right, man. Protect and serve. No. Like say, yeah. Do you know what they are now? Do you know that two of them came out to Calgary one time unannounced, face-to-face, looked at me and said, stop what you're doing, shut down that website, or I'm going to destroy you. What? Yes. Sandwich cop. Two Sandwich cops. Hmm. Came to my place of work unannounced. Wow. Yeah, that's what they do for you. They try and shut you up. They try and make you go crazy. They threaten you. Yeah, they do everything. Another cop in Saanich told a friend of mine, we've done everything we could to try and find out a way to arrest Buziak, and we can't find anything. When my friend told me that, I was like, Wow, that's messed up. Well, it's harder. They're working harder to get you gotta, in the damn case. Right. They're spending time trying to figure out how to arrest me to shut me up. Yeah. And they can't And they can't solve my daughter's murder. Like, that's fucked up. So how long has it been since they, when they kind of put you in the blind side with this cold case, we're going to make it a cold case, but then you ask for the files, they tell you to go eat lunch, and you come back and then they, they change their mind and not going to do it because they'd have to give you the files. So that's been years now. Yeah, that was now. year two. Yeah, wow. That was year two. That's when I started to think, uh-oh, there's something wrong here. Wow. Something really wrong here. Yeah, I saw that interview and I was blown away. I didn't realize it was yeah. that long ago. That's messed up. Well, oh, without, a, without a doubt, in my opinion, cover up. Cover up. Yeah. Cover up for their incompetence, cover up for their involvement, and cover up for a friend somewhere, someplace. Somebody that they write knows, knows who that works. is. That's works. There's yeah. actually, there's a history of that in that police force. Mm. I talked to one of the ex-members, and he said, you know, the word is there, we protect our friends. Yeah. Hmm. Damn. Yeah, they're an antiquated police force that should be disbanded. Victoria is such a weird place, because... It's divided up into about 12 municipalities, municipal districts, and there's only like 400,000 people. So, some of them aren't sort of official districts. So let's just say, though, there's, I think there's 10 mayors and 10 councils. Mm -hmm. And there's five police forces for 400,000 people. It's like a joke. Hmm. And they're all sort of like, soccer teams, you know, those guys suck, they don't know what they're doing, that's their mentality, Hmm. it's like high school mentality, 
Sounds like it, Jeff. You know, I live in a city with 1.2 million people. We have one police force. Of course. They got five out there hmm. for less than half the people. Just totally useless. Well, Jeff, is there one last thing you want to add before we close out this show, man? Anything you want to say? Yeah, I certainly want to say that, you know, one, I really thank you, gentlemen, for having me on your show. Two, I just want to thank everybody for all their support. Three, my heart goes out to all people out there suffering from the loss of a loved one to homicide. Just bad news nasty business to have to deal with devastation and uh, you know the final thing is I'm not going to stop I'm quiet at times but I'm not stopping and I don't stop even when I'm quiet I'm working in the background and I want people to know that I'm going to stay with this till it's done or I die and I want the killers and conspirators to know I'm fucking coming from you and I'm more determined than ever wow. and I'm not even angry anymore. It's just determination. I'm going to get you, you bastards. Get them, man. Get yeah. you. Go get them. Well, Jeff, we keep thank you. We keep Lindsay in our prayers and we think about this case all the time and we keep you in our prayers. Um, yeah, when I said you, earlier, sir. you was like a hero because I have two daughters and I see you out there just fighting your guts out for her. And I'm like, man, I would be right here in your shoes. And I'm just proud of everything you've Absolutely. done. Absolutely. Man, you just, I just, I don't know what to say. It's just, you're the man. Yeah. You just, you're just badass, Jeff. You are. <laughs> yeah. And well, thank you, sir. Just, just keep on keeping on and keep us posted on anything that develops. And we'll certainly keep you in our prayers, man. Thank you very much, and don't be afraid to call me for update, and please send me a link for when you do the episode. Yeah, oh, for sure. I'll edit this over the weekend, and I'll drop it Monday morning, and I will send you a link. I'll email you a link, dude. Thank you very much, sir. Sounds good, Jeff. Thanks so much for, for giving your uh, uh, giving us your time today, buddy. Thank you, sir. God bless, Jeff. Have a good night, man. Okay. Good night. Good night. Bye-bye. Dale, I want to thank Jeff Buziak for Thanks. being on the show. Thank you so much, man. Yeah, I know you. You work hard, come home, and you just like well, just fit us in because you can fit us in, and we really appreciate it. Yeah, that's probably one of the one of the sort of top of the line of the people we really wanted to talk to. Yeah, we've wanted to talk to him for a while. Yeah, I don't we've, think we just didn't have the guts <laughs> to reach out. To well, think, you know, well, we've kicked it back and forth. You know, should we reach out to him? Should we not? You right. know, didn't know what was going on, and yeah. and hey, man, he was so pleasant to come back and was eager to do our show. Yeah great man yes yeah. wow so i hope you guys love that as much as i do because he definitely did not hold back and he said it from the beginning i'm definitely not one to hold back so put on your seat belt yeah, <laughs> that's what we, it was you know we just wanted to do our part to keep Lindsay's story out there man yes and that's the the main thing the main thing so we just want to thank jeff again for giving his time thank you so much and i know we've been here for a while so let's just get out of here all right dude we want everyone to be safe please be careful and always be aware of your surroundings because the next episode could be about you. This is the Crack House Chronicles. Chronicles.